Hi everyone, I'm Joe Saskell and welcome to What A Flanker, the podcast series two. Now my guest today is an English comedian, presenter, actor and writer. He's best known for his roles in the series Fresh Meat, Bad Education, A League of Their Own and Travels With My Father. It's of course, Jack Whitehall. How are you, sir? I should have got you to do my census. Yes, I should have done. How how weird was that? I didn't know what to put because DJ Cage fighting podcaster was not a great was not a great thing, and you know it was very odd that massive flanker, surely. Yes, yes. I mean that's what a lot of people would have said if they're writing the, the uh, census about me, but not unfortunately how I describe myself. <laughs> um, how have you been? How's lockdown? Uh, yeah, good. I mean, I'm looking forward to coming out the other end of it, um, but uh, I'm going back to work in a couple of weeks, uh, which is nice. I'm doing another series with my dad. So gonna be spending some time with him, which is great. And uh, filming that, which is always a fun show to do. Um, and then, yeah, doing the Brit Awards after that. So it's nice. Finally, I've got some kind of exciting things in the diary and it all feels like the the end is in sight. Have you managed to do much work? Cause I'm gonna, I wanna to talk to you about your, your foods, that stuff, but have you had a chance to do much while you've been in lockdown? Yeah, I've done quite a lot of writing projects and I filmed a series of uh, the League of Their Own road trip with those guys. It was the longest record ever. It, like We started um, in like October last year and we finished maybe two weeks ago. It, it, it took that long in COVID to film uh, that series and it was only like a couple of episodes. Um, yeah. Were it not getting his extensive uh, plastic surgery, uh, he would have aged over the course of the episode. But fortunately, his face never moves or aged. So we were fine. For That's continuity. what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say. The continuity must be awful. Like his his t- colouring and tan alone must have dramatically changed for the different seasons. Or is it continuously a deep, rich mahogany? Yeah, poor people in the edit and in the grade, they have to balance that out. Um, the only guy that you start filming a series with him and uh, he gets less wrinkled by the end of it. What were you guys doing? Can you tell me, or was it a bit top secret? Oh, yeah, we did some really fun stuff. We did uh, SAS training with uh, Jason Fox um, up in Scotland, uh, which was uh, really intense. He was good. He was quite hard on us um, and really, uh, you know, pushed us. I was quite good, actually. I always thought if I was in the army, I'd be probably like high command, sat in an office somewhere far away, sending people to their deaths. But actually I was quite good at boots on the ground and some of the more active tasks. I managed to like get up a, a rope ladder and, and go up a, is it a ravine? Yeah, or I mean, maybe. I'm, I'm making out like I know. What you, yeah, I mean, I think. Oh, come on, you do that kind of thing of a weekend, you, surely. You can traverse a ravine. I think ravine is sort traverse. of. Traverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was doing, traversing a ravine. I, I thought you, I always imagine you very much, as you described, in sort, sort of a red felt coat, sitting at yeah. least 400 miles behind the front line in a, some sort of tent with silverware being, you know, and, and your dinner being served while everyone's in a rations in a trench. Very much like Lord Melchard from Blackadder. Yeah. Yeah, very much. Yeah, the young Stephen Fry. That's the that's what I would model myself on. Um, in fr- yeah, just you know, drinking scotch and looking at a large map and and pushing some little figurines around and, and asking how and ask you how much land you've taken and they go what the map and it's one to one. You've just got a small grass patch and that's all they've yeah. achieved. How many people, <laughs> how many people died to get this? Twenty thousand. Good good work. More clarity. Good work. Jolly good men. Yeah, let's have some more clarity. Yeah, I thought that that would be my vibe, but no. It turns out action jack. I'm there. Kicking down doors, asking some questions later, jumping on grenades. I love that from you, though. I love that. I mean, you know, we're going to come on to young what young Jack Whitehall was like, but you know, I know that you, um, you you're like a man of many surprises. You know, a, a, you know, a bit of a heartthrob, actor, comedian, and now sort of a potential SAS member. I think what would hold you back is the potential sort of sarcastic lip and sort of the answering back and the sort of laissez-faire. Because I think you'd be a bit like. Um, the guy from Ain't Half Ar- Ar- Hot Mum with a sort of a flat cap, jauntily put at an angle, uniform untucked, which would uh, undo you, I think. Yeah, I think that would probably be my downfall is the attitude problem. Uh, and I think um, when push comes to shove, uh, if we were in an actual um, behind enemy line situation, um, some of the responses that I gave to Jason Fox and some of the other SAS commanders probably would have had me shot and buried in a shallow grave. Yeah, because I can imagine they just go, listen, I just, I really just don't think you should be shouting at me. You know, look, can't we, can't, you know, look, why do you have to get up so early for war? I just don't understand. Constructive I'm... criticism. 
Yeah. There's not enough of that. It's all just shouting and swearing. Did, did Freddie take it too seriously? Was he quite aggressive with it? He was very good. Uh, Jamie was very good. Romesh was... I mean, I know you're meant to never leave a man behind, but maybe that should be caveated with unless that man is Romesh Ranganathan. Okay, okay. Because you can't really go to glasses... Uh, can't go to war with glasses on. I imagine that the enemy would have sort of no... Kind of no, no sacrifice. You know what? You can't go to war with glasses on. I am a spectacle wearer. I am now. I now wear contact lenses. But I found some photos the other day of me playing rugby at the school, and I played rugby in glasses. I had the Adidas glasses with the little springs on the side of it, and I played in. You know, I played in spectacles. And I remember at the time, everyone being like, "You can't play rugby in glasses." I was like, "Look, I'm not going anywhere near any contact, so I think I can get away with playing in glasses." So there's all these photographs of me playing for my school in glasses. Do you know the other thing I did? I took conversions, and for some reason, I converted the ball. I would take off my boot. My, the, I was right footed. I'd take off my right boot. I'd tee up the ball in the boot, and then I'd convert with a like a bare foot. And I was actually really good, but for some reason, I was just like, that's the way I like to do it. I feel like I've got more control when I'm kicking it with a bare foot. I look like a lunatic in glasses, shoe off teed up on the sh- on the boot and I was good I was very good at conversions that was the only thing I was good at it's any wonder that you've been as successful as you are because I can't I'm, like I, I, there's something you posted on Instagram the other day and obviously when this episode comes out I'm not sure but people can, can go trawling through your social media like they like true stalkers they are and there was a great video and it showed you kind of uh you know jack across the ages that that highlights at school i what i assume was either a first governor might be in your sister you on holiday you and your dad dancing what a big difference between those two things <laughs> yeah yeah oh, yeah I know, I know you're a well-to-do family but you're not yeah we're not into that no 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 not we marry cousins etc but no i just there is a wide gulf but i remember seeing you thinking i went to school with about a thousand miniature Jack Whitehalls, you know, with and I with the sort of the rugby shirt on in the in the pub, tucked in with the belt on, with a jump around your neck. Um, but you wore goggles as well, which oh no, sorry, wore glasses. But you know, the next progression would have been goggles. Yeah, yeah, there was probably goggles. There was goggles. There was braces. There was very loud and eccentric clothing. But I wouldn't have gone to school with you because you went to Wellington. That was too uh, too good at sport. I needed to go to a school that was better for the more artistically inclined. <laughs> Did you actually go to a specific artistic school? It's one of the questions I had. Did you go to drama school or did you go to, you know? I went to, no, I went to Marlborough, which was a little bit sort of artier of those um, schweffy schools. I can't Can I tell you though, I played for Wellington. Have you? Yeah, I played for Wellington because Wellington came to play us at, I think it was actually cricket, but we, I was in the bottom team and I was like the 12th man and Wellington turned up and someone was ill and so they didn't have enough players. So I got sent to play on their team. And so I got given to Wellington because they were like, let's just give them Jack because I think if anything, that will be advantageous to us. Anyway, I played for Wellington. My mom and dad had come down to watch the match and they watched me play for another school. But actually, I was really good. It was my high score. I high scored for Wellington against all of my friends. I love that. But you were like the absolute Trojan horse sent yeah. in by Marlborough, but actually ended up destroying them. Yeah. Oh, mate, that's incredible. I, do you know what I am? Um... Please take me back with you on the bus. They were like, oh, you're all right. Stay here. <laughs> I've got no friends here. And I, I, I promise yeah. I'll leave the goggles. Oh, um, I, um, do you know what? If I was going to describe you in one picture, it was, an, uh, I don't know what an old Marlborough, Marlborough person is. What do you call them? What do you call yourself? Old Mulburian. Old Mulburian. You look like yeah. an old Mulburian. I, I, of all that in that video, that I was, th- I couldn't work out which school I was thinking of in my head, but it was Marlborough. Mm. I love it. I'm very jealous because I, I was too much of a meathead to ever be mm. kind of have my lid dyed. Now I can't do it because my hair's falling out. Um, but I wanted to know it, uh, a little bit about obviously we, you know, the, the lockdown stuff. But talk to me about food slut that you've been up to as well because that seems to be something you've been doing recently. Yeah, that was just a fun like project in in lockdown, really, because I'm very into my food, and my my brother and one of my best mates um, are also kind of big foodies, and and we you know cook a lot and and watch a lot of kind of like recipes and 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 you know chefs and stuff like that, and go to restaurants and sort of ended up doing a little bit of it on on social media, and then did some uh, some charity stuff with the the Felix project. We did some. Um, kind of like online competitions and things like that and then yeah ended up doing a pop-up restaurant and uh and now doing a collaboration with uh 
um, the guys at Beer and Burger and, us, and doing some kind of like burgers that we're doing on Deliveroo and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, it's all been like a little fun side project and a bit of a distraction whilst some of the other works have been a little bit slower over the last six months. Uh, it's certainly not where I saw my career moving. <laughs> uh, I'm literally gone from, you know, uh, selling out arenas to flipping burgers. I was about to say the next <laughs> step is McDonald's. That is the, the progression yeah. of your path is arenas, your own sort of food pop up, next service manager at your local McDonald's. Now, come on. If I was at McDonald's again, like with the army, I think I would be in a managerial post. Okay. And right. Maybe you can put in a good word with me. I know you've been hanging outside a lot of McDonald's <laughs> recently in your car. Do you know what? There's a lot. I have actually. I remember. I, for, I, I saw. Forgot, I forgot you would have seen that. I shouldn't make. I shouldn't <laughs> yeah. make jokes when you know what I'm about. I, know. I follow you on Instagram. I saw it. Yeah. I also saw the angry clap back when we were getting crap for it. Oh my god! I, I was like, why is he not just sucked it up? No. If you do branded content, you have to accept that at some point you're going to have to eat a little bit of a shit sandwich online. <laughs> yeah, but actually, I it wasn't a problem with that. It was the very fact that I was getting bombarded by these people saying that how could I advocate keeping a gym open or keeping gyms open and fast food and it was the whole fact that people demonize fast food I, I know it, so it's, you know it's insane really no that is insane and also you're just like well, go look at the rocks Instagram <laughs> look at those cheap meals and look at him I know clearly you're allowed to have a day off I know that was that was that was kind of um that was kind of mad but I, I know the food stuff thing was really exciting because you actually you almost ended my marriage when, um, not for anything nefarious, for people people get too excited. I know you are a heartthrob, <laughs> but um, but uh, you obviously asked me to do a cook along with you. And during at the time, the Wi Fi in my house was rubbish, so I started barbecuing. We were going to do a barbecue along, mm. um, and I ended up barbecuing in my kitchen. I brought an open coal barbecue into my kitchen to to do that, and my wife luckily was was not in. Uh, but when she came back and there was like a bit of black smoke on the ceiling and the whole house full of smoke and, you know, yeah. I burnt my fingers carrying a hot barbecue in while it was lit. It's quite impressive. Yeah, yeah, it was, I thought you know, the whole house was going to go down and I was thinking, well, this would obviously be tragic for you. It would be great for for the views, for the content. You've got to think of it. Content is king. But yeah, I was doing a lot of that cooking. I've actually, I'm a little bit anxious doing this podcast with you right now because today was quite an exciting day because I, um, I've i ordered a Kimono Joe, which is like this insane barbecue. And it arrived 20 minutes before this podcast. And I didn't realize quite how big it was. It's like tons. And the guy delivering it said he couldn't get it through the door. So he's just left it on the street outside. And I'm waiting for my brother to come back so he can try and drag it into the house because I wasn't strong enough to do it on my own. So currently there is a very, very expensive top of the range barbecue just on the street outside my house. And I'm just praying that I don't finish this podcast, look out of the window and see that it's gone. I mean, listen, you're going to need a gang to lift a Komodo Joe out of... That's true. That's what I thought. I was like, you'd need, A, like some real barbecue enthusiasts to know what that was in the box. And then secondly, you would need, a, yeah, like a large posse or gang with a forklift truck possibly to be able to move that thing. And then even if, even if they nicked it, you know, it, it, you know, it needs quite a lot of time and attention and you need to read that. It's not like a impulse theft, a Kimono Joe, because no. you then need to go and steal a load of wood chips as well if you want to use it to its full extent. And also, people who are stealing stuff, I don't imagine they've got like a plethora of, of cut meats, charcoals, <laughs> w woods, a place to install it. They haven't got a bed, let alone yeah. a place to put a barbecue. Yeah, you'd have a week and then just dump it in the Thames. <laughs> I'm bad with that, but actually, I, Komodo Joe, I haven't tried them. A lot of my teammates, because as you know, I'm big into my my barbecue, but they are very professional. Can I give you one piece of advice? Yeah. You probably already do this, is cook everything to temperature, never to time. Yeah, cook to temperature, never to time. I've got several thermometers downstairs as well. Right. I'm going to be like an expert by the end of this lockdown. I actually saw Joe Marler's cook on, he did one on a Komodo Joe the other day. And all I could think about was if you had a beard like his, I don't know whether I'd want to be cooking over a load of wood chips and smoke. It must absolutely reek for the next couple of days, just smelling of smoked meat. Although maybe that's quite nice. Maybe that's, Joe Marla likes that. Maybe his missus is into it. Maybe maybe her favourite <laughs> aphrodisiac smell is cooked meats. I don't, I can't imagine. But I- It's kind of weird that I watch that and I think about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, 
<laughs> I mean, there's so many alarm bells over some of the stuff that you're. That you're I mean, but you've. I still can't get past my the goggles and the the kick, taking your boots off and using another boot for a tea. I'll send you a picture. I'll try and give you a picture so we can right. flash that up. Or it, it, it's 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 it, it's utterly ridiculous, utterly ridiculous. But I remember at the time thinking that everyone else was utterly ridiculous for not doing it the way that I did it. But but and who's had the last laugh? A bit like Alan Partridge. Look at you now. You know. Yeah. Look exactly. at you now. You you know you're you're one stop away from a from a McDonald's apprenticeship, and yeah. you know uh, but you're coming back with Arena Tour soon, so you know the roller coaster of of, of life. I want to see who dares wins, like that Fosby guy when he started jumping over the you know thing with his back first. They must have all thought, well, look at that melt. <laughs> yeah. We knew it was a key, and then he cleared it. Yes, exactly. And, you know, it's only a matter of time until Owen Farrell goes. I'm missing so many of these. I'm going to try doing it with a bare foot. Owen Farrell, if you're listening to this podcast and you're, no, no, no. <laughs> I would say probably about 900%, you're definitely not listening to it because you can't stand my shit chat. He might tune in because of you, but we're recommending that um, Owen, you should kick barefoot because Jack says you're not kicking's not going that well. No, no, no. I meant that was just a, that was just a random. Oh. F- that was the first fly half that popped into my head. So if anything, it was a compliment. Fine, fine. I didn't mean it specifically about Owen Farrell. Um, I want to know a little bit about you know a young Jack. What 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 was a young Jack Whitehall like? Because obviously now we see you kind of you know um, you're confident, polished. Were you always kind of a, a loud mouth? Were you trying to make people laugh? What were you like? Uh, yeah, I guess I was quite um, gregarious when I was at school. I think. With comedy and comedians, a lot of comedians, well, especially me, they just find stand-up comedy and it becomes an outlet for their um, often quite unbearable personality. And once you've found that outlet, you become a much more leveled and nice person to be around. I think probably before I found stand-up comedy, I was um, just a tit and always wanting attention and always trying to be really funny and in the centre of attention at every juncture and then probably was able to go and release some of that on stage and then off it be a slightly easier person to be in the presence of. What were you like if you if you see young kids now were you like daddy daddy look mummy look look now look now look uh, the, the entire time? Oh yeah all the time and always you know trying to put on little performances and dress up and fool around. And, and I watched like, cause my mom's documented our entire life um, to a ridiculous level. Um, there's so many home videos and photographs and I look at all of them and I'm like, wow, you know, I give my family a lot of stick, but they, they deserve a medal for putting up with a child like that. Although that said, they do deserve a medal for putting up with a child like that, but they didn't have to put up with me for very long. Cause I was basically raised by nannies and then they booted me off to boarding school. So I'm like, they put up with me in the weeks, maybe months, if you add them all together of my childhood that we were in the same room. <laughs> You're very much like Mowgli, but a posh Mowgli from the Jungle Book. But instead of, instead of the jungle, instead of the jungle, it was boarding school. That you were yeah. brought up by nannies and and yeah, public school. Well, I don't get why I have such good relationship with them. I, I don't know. It was just nanny, 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 nanny boarding school. Like how? Maybe that's the key, is that we've had so little time together. And if I had spent that time with my dad, we would have driven each other mad. Well, it, I mean, the best thing is when people talk about long distance relationships, uh, you know, and they work so well, it's because you never see your partner. You've got nothing to argue about. <laughs> we just get to see each other on weekends. We've only got the best bits. I mean, my my parents, I remember once when they, I went to boarding school, very similar to, to yourself. Uh, from the age 10 to kind of 18. And I remember like, holding on to my dad's hand one weekend. I was like, Daddy, can I come home? And he just turned to me and went, Son, there's a reason we've sent you to boarding school. We don't want you bloody at home. And then <laughs> <laughs> and they drove off in the distance with me and my tiny little juice box. And that was my that was my childhood. And my mum, the worst bit was my mum obviously wasn't fully on board with it because she would sort of cry. You know, if we had to go back from, for a holiday, she'd be like, I don't want you to go back to school. And I was like, well, we, we don't send us back to boarding school then, mum. I can't, I can't. I was like, well, you're not trying that fucking hard, are you? And then I was back in boarding school. Was, wow, it's taken it's taken a a, a a deep turn. This this I, it has, it's quite cathartic. It has, it I'm has. About this, we're just unloading all this angst. I know. I didn't realize it was going to be like that, but I, I love the fact that you do have a great relationship with your parents. But would would they be heartbroken if they if they heard you describe it as kind of I kind of just a fleeting glance of a childhood where they were sort of involved? Like you kind of went to school and then met them on your 18th birthday or something like that. It sounds like. Yeah, I, know. I think they probably would think that I maybe had slightly rewritten history there. 
well, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. We all know That's that. <laughs> what would um, what would your report card say from your school days? Was it anything like you know, mine was always you know uh, doesn't really concentrate, could try harder, you know, tries to be the centre of attention, something like that. Yeah, I was I got a lot of that um, and a lot of stuff about being kind of uh, disruptive and 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 trying to you know um, I, I broke quite a lot of rules. I think when I was at school and got in trouble a fair bit, but always for quite weird stuff. Like what? <sighs> oh God. There was a lot of like nudity. <laughs> what? Of all the things you were gonna say, I did yeah. not expect nudity. Explain please explain. There was one there was one and it, it was an art project, but we were filming some like weird video and I ended up naked in a field and there headmaster's wife was walking her dog and saw me naked in a field and then I tried to run away but she'd spotted me and then I got in quite a lot of trouble for that and because I guess to her she didn't know that we were filming an art project she just <laughs> I was exposing myself to her in a field so kind of I guess fair enough but that I remember being a bit of an issue and then the other one and this this one again like it wasn't it's let sort of less no it's not less weird than it sounds but my friend at school, Freddie, wanted to do a, again, this is a nude one. He wanted to do a drawing of his girlfriend and do a drawing of her, like, life drawing, like, you know, Titanic. I that think. old chestnut, yeah. That old chestnut. Anyway, he said to me, <laughs> like, I, I, I have to just accept that his motives were pure. But he was like, look, in order to do that, I want this to be, like, a legitimate art project. And I want to go and do it in the art school. But the only way I'm going to be able to get around that is if I also draw a guy and you're my mate. So maybe I should draw you. And then she's not going to think it's weird. The art teacher's not going to think it's weird. It's just like a legitimate thing. I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, sure. That sounds fine. So then like one Saturday afternoon, we all went off to the art block and uh, I was going to do it first. So I sort of stripped off. It was really awkward. He drew me. Um, <laughs> and then uh as he just sort of finished drawing me the art teacher arrived like saw us walked in was like what the hell is going on freddie hadn't got permission from the art teacher he didn't tell me that art teacher flipped out it's like what are you doing right go home immediately i'm calling your housemaster shut down the whole thing like the girl who was going to arrive like 10 minutes later obviously did and saw that this was happening and just like went back home so he never drew her he just ended up drawing me and it was just two dudes in the art center on an afternoon, like sketching each other naked. And that was obviously the story that went out to the world and what the house master told my mom and dad. I was like, no, no, there were lots of mitigating circumstances. He was meant to be drawing his girlfriend. It wasn't, but obviously my dad heard that version of the story that he was told by the art teacher and, and probably read it slightly differently. And that's the story you're going with and you're going to stick with, is it? Yes. Yes. She, I, I, the girl was definitely going to be... I mean, I never saw the girl arrive. <laughs> Fuck. Right. Don't... Right. Me. And he's still, like, my really good friend. And it's before his name, Fred. Freddie. Freddie. And Freddie still, and Freddie still maintains that um, he, he's got a girlfriend. He had a girlfriend. He just... And it wasn't... Yeah. He had a girlfriend and he really wanted to draw her. So in order to be able to draw her, he wanted to draw me first. I've actually, I found the photo some years ago because again, my mother kept it for some reason. That's the other weird thing is that I took the photo home and then my mum kept it. So there's like a, a nude photo of me, but I'm really ashamed in the picture. Like I'm turning away from him so you can just see my ass and I'm looking over my shoulder and I just look really, sh I look really shameful in the picture, like really embarrassed. Yeah, I mean... I, I can imagine you were because I think your friend might have lured you down and hasn't quite reconciled his feelings towards you and wanted to draw you. But of all the nude poses, just a tiny bit of ass. Like, yeah, a tiny bit of ass, and then a, just a, just a, like there's a slither of nutsack oh. just sneaking out the bottom. Which I don't know whether he just added that or whether he could actually see it. I mean, I, I and then and then the, the girl was supposed to turn up. I mean, and what what did your dad? I mean, how does your dad deal with that then? I don't know. I think he's always been quite weird around Freddie. Yeah, I can imagine. I like, le never left you too unattended. Like if you went, exactly. Daddy, we're, go we're going for a drive. Daddy, we're going for a walk. I'll come, and he's suddenly always oh, there. Yeah, I think he's. I think he's always had mixed feelings about Freddie since then. Did, did the did the um art teacher actually physically see you, or did she see she you sort of trying to put on two tables that have been pushed together, lying in a sort of coital position with my ass? 
um, pouting towards Freddie, who was sketching it in charcoals. And Vincent, his name is Vincent, the art teacher, which was brilliant. And I remember just seeing his little green shoes because he, he had little eccentric green shoes and he walked up to the door and then opened the door. And he, I don't think he even said anything. He just he, he just shut the door and then I got off on my trousers and then we walked out and he was waiting for us and he was not best pleased. Well, I mean, I, again, this podcast has taken so many turns, so much like your career in recent months, in the roller coaster that it is. This, this well, there may be no career now. Well, I mean, listen, any time I've told that story, they're not going to employ me at McDonald's if they hear that. I, I'm a bit concerned that your career can't be that going that well to even accept the invitation from my crap podcast. <laughs> uh, but you are actually quite a good company. You've had Jimmy Carr and Carl mm. Cox and a few other people on here, so I'm quite, I'm quite excited. So, did I, they tell stories about being sketched naked by their friends at school? Um. No, Jimmy. No, no. He no. He was a bit more serious. Um, but that's what we know. But a yin and yang. That's not a problem. I, I've I, actually skipped Jimmy Carr naked. Have you? Yeah, I did that. Eight out of ten cats does countdown, and I had to do something during the countdown, and I sketched Jimmy, and I sketched him naked. But he wasn't naked. He was in a oh. suit during the record. I just decided that I would sketch him naked, but I had to use my imagination and drew him with no genitals because I imagine Jimmy doesn't have any genitals, even though he's got a child now. But do you reckon he's like smooth, like an action man, that kind of action thing? Man, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I tend to agree that actually. If he, if, he, yeah. if I didn't, if he, if I knew he didn't have a kid, I would have thought he would have um, be completely smooth, kind of like a Ken doll. Yeah. With, with new set of teeth and a beautiful new lid. Yeah, new lid, and then just a sm just really smooth little package. And just not really into that sex. Just doesn't really ever get that overly excited. I imagine just sort of. No, you just lie down and tell one liners. Well, there you have it. Um, well, your parents have obviously got both big characters, right? Do you, do you think that helped kind of shape the way you are in, in, in your comedy? Because they, 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 do they encourage you really, you know, quite a lot? Or were they a bit like, Christ, Jack, shut up? I know you said you weren't really with them a lot, but... No, I, I, I think they were very inspirational to me in terms of, like, going into comedy. My father was always very funny and very witty and uh, was like a natural kind of raconteur. And, and whenever I was around him, I was always kind of in in awe of him and found him very funny and and looked at him and thought you know that's the type of person I want to be when I'm older and my mum is also you know an actress and a performer and is um you know very funny in her own right so I I think that definitely helped me kind of choose the path that I did and I definitely didn't expect to end up doing a kind of weird family variety act with them but uh you know they they they, they certainly can spin a yarn and can tell a joke and, and uh, you know, funny people. Has your dad, so my dad was very similar to, to yours in terms of, um, you know, co co you know, comedy was always the uh, attention, you know, center of attention. My friends really liked him. They loved to have a beer with him. But obviously, as he's got older, his comedy timing slightly gone. So whereas it was quite amusing, sometimes it can be a bit like a sledgehammer through a window. Um, yeah. Is your dad maintained that, that comedy time or just sometimes you go, dad, I just, you just, yeah. Need to... yeah, no, I think he's maintained the comedy timing. I mean, obviously, as they get older, the, the content of some of their routines is not necessarily um, the kind of fair that you would want heard by the rest of the world, especially in the age of social media when your father has Twitter. Like the last six months have been quite tense, six months for me. There's been a fair few evenings or a fair few days when I've, you know, uh, woken up and seen the news and had to text my mum and go just make sure he's away from his phone today and doesn't get anywhere near Twitter because I don't think <laughs> we want the world knowing what he's saying behind closed doors yeah so, so you do have to rein him in a bit you know just say listen dad that's not acceptable anymore we don't talk about that you can't do exactly. that right perfect yeah. I won't push you on that what um you know, when you were kind of growing up, obviously you talked about your parents having influence. Did you have um, any sort of acting or comedy idols that you really looked up to that thought, do you know what, I'd like to be like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I had a fair few that uh, people that I kind of like really admired. I remember really loving Jack D. Um, he was one of my favourite comedians. He was on, you know, those original series of Live at the Apollo on on the BBC. And, and I remember watching him and finding him so funny and... Uh, in fact, when I first started doing stand-up, I kind of imitated his act a bit. I did a kind of deadpan homage to Jack D, which didn't really work for me. But I remember thinking he was really, really cool. And, um, uh, you know, Rowan Atkinson. I love people like Rowan Atkinson, Peter Cook. John Cleese was um, someone that was a kind of hero of mine. I actually got to work with him a couple of years ago. 
which was great. Um, he's so fun and really got such a wicked sense of humor and, and it was really, um, really, really um, nice to work with and very, very supportive. And he actually came to a gig of mine. I did a gig in New York, a filming in New York. And I did a, uh, a stand-up routine because I was warming up for my tour and John said he wanted to come down and see it. So I uh, went down to this club in Manhattan and asked for, you know, whether I could have a plus one. And they were like, because oh, when you're doing it in, in, uh, in New York, like, I don't know, I have much less cash over there and no one really knows who I am. So uh, I called them up and they were a bit, I was like, yeah, I guess you can have a, you can have a plus one. I was like, they were like, what's the name? I was like, it's, um, it's actually John Cleese. They're like, uh, what, what, like John Cleese, John Cleese. I was like, yeah, it's like John Cleese. So maybe just like put him at the back. It was a tiny club. So we arrived and I went on and I did my set and John was sat there. Obviously John's like eight foot tall. So there was all these people sat at tables and I was doing my routine and all I could see was John's face in this like pool of light. It was quite an intense gig. Like I was literally performing for one person desperate to make him laugh. But fortunately I think he enjoyed some of it. Did, did you make um, him laugh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, yeah, he was, he was a very um, generous with his laughter and looked like he enjoyed it and then afterwards like everyone in the club wanted to photograph with him which was kind of did make you hold the camera excuse me mate can you take yeah, a photo? I, no, I was i was very much holding the camera as everyone got a photograph with him i love you because I, I love you saying about um you know uh john cleese because you know faulty towers is something i listed you know when i when i was younger the kind of stuff that i was into was blackadder again rowan atkinson yeah john cleese i love that kind of stuff jack d as well was it was amazing tell me about that trying to imitate his kind of act because one of the things I, I i wanted to know was did you embrace the kind of slightly ca um, i mean with all due respect <laughs> before you normally insult someone is what you say but do you do you do you embrace the kind of slightly camp posh public school thing in the early days or did you try and reinvent yourself as something else no yeah i definitely tried to reinvent myself I, I felt like going on and being um a sort of you know flouncy posh boy uh, especially because I started in in Manchester doing stand up and doing lots of gigs in like or working men's clubs and pubs and uh, you know nightclubs and stuff, uh, g going around all those like satellite towns around Manchester. I felt like if I went on and was uh, you know myself, that it would be harder for me. And so I tried to kind of mask it and uh, did a deadpan act. Did a kind of uh, like poor man's Danny Dyer voice for many years where I just was desperate for no one to know uh, my true roots. Um, but you can't really get away with that unless it's like a proper full on like character act. And it wasn't, it was just a kind of uh, a, a way of trying to deceive the audience and a lot of comedy. I think the best comedy comes from truth and being introspective and the minute I started owning it and going on and sending it up and, and embracing it, audiences loved it so much more. But it was definitely a journey to get there. And it was as much a journey as sort of being comfortable in your own skin and being, um, uh, you know, open to the idea of just going on and owning it that, that mm, was the real like breakthrough for me. And you keep getting told when you're doing stand up, people always go, oh, yeah. You know, for me, when I started, it was like, oh, you can write jokes and you've got some nice material, but you, you haven't got a comic voice you need to find your voice and it sounds like so cryptic and when you're that age you're so ambitious and I just was like well, what is my voice and they're like you need to find it I was like it's not a bloody Star Wars film can you just tell me what my voice is and you know it was and it was it was literally all the all the people like in the know and the comedy club promoters like when you found your voice you'll know was like, stop just tell me what it is <laughs> and then you realize that your voice is essentially just like finding what your angle is you know once you can let the audience know your your what, what your persona is once it's really clearly defined and once you have an angle, it means all material will be made funnier because they know where you're coming from and they buy into this character that they're watching on stage. And so the minute I was able to find that, it felt like I had found a little kind of niche and 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 people um when I went on stage, you know, in the first couple of minutes, I would sort of set up who I am and, and it makes the whole of the rest of the set easier because all of the jokes are coming from the some kind of same perspective. Um, whereas in the old days, it was a bit more like scattergun and, and trying lots of different things. It's so funny you talk about finding your voice. You know, when I got into DJ, people would say, listen, you've just got to find your sound. And I was like, okay, well, what do you think it should be? And they're like, well, you know, what are you into? I said, well, this, go, well, you know, maybe that is your sound, but I wouldn't go into that sound 
You're like, well, no, but you said, you said that. Well, you said that. <laughs> Man, I don't think anyone knows what the fuck they're doing. I, I think if it works and people laugh, then it's, then it's your thing. But I, I 100% agree with you. Being true to yourself. And I was interested because I, I asked Jimmy Carr something similar because he, you know, comes across as, as quite posh uh, as well and kind of has that. But actually, that's his more his polished routine. And because he's doing one line, one liners, it's very yeah. different than kind of doing stories and kind of yeah. long, long setups. And, and I wondered, dude, did you did you really you've obviously started with comedy over acting. Did you have to did you do all those clubs? Did you really grind it out? Sort of, you know, were there moments where you thought, Christ, is this ever going to go anywhere? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm in a fortunate position where I had a relatively um, nice safety net. <laughs> I came from the background that I came from, so I can't ever like lie and be like, "Oh, it was," you know, I, I never knew when the next paycheck was coming, and I was terrified that I, you know, would be out on the street. Like, obviously, that was not the case for me, and I'm in- immensely privileged, and you know, was able to start very early when uh i was you know 17 um and so i you know i got into it very early um and you know you everyone has to go through a certain amount of um you know trial and error and and doing those small gigs and uh playing the circuit and i and i do think what's great about comedy is stand-up comedy is that i i I genuinely believe it is a bit of a meritocracy and you you do it's very hard to to cheat it and to get to you know doing paid club gigs and being on tv or you know without having put in the work and without having done lots of gigs and without having you know paid your dues and, and learned to get good at it you, ha- you just have to ha- have stage time you know that that is the key you you need to do as many gigs as you can and the more gigs you do the better you will get and it's why most of the best comedians are a bit older and have been doing it for ages because it's something that you just get better at i think so um, yeah, I mean, I certainly had to do a lot of like crap um, student gigs and, and pubs and bars with no one there and, you know, dodgy sound systems and, um, you know, not getting paid and all of that. Like there was, you know, years of that, uh, but I kind of loved it. And, and as I said, I was, you know, I was still at uni for quite a, f- a fair bit of it, which meant it was still like a kind of fun, exciting hobby. And then when it became... Uh, more of a living it, I was already pretty far advanced and, and was able to kind of head straight into it so I'm, I'm very fortunate in that sense um, and I accelerated through the kind of ranks quite quickly I think I got to doing um, you know paid weekends which is the the pinnacle for a, you know a club comedian when you start is being able to go and do paid weekends at the comedy store or Glee or any of these clubs um and i was able to get there quite quickly uh but um i think i was only able to get there that quickly because i was able to get loads of stage time and i got loads of stage time i think again because i because i started in in manchester i think there were lots of gigs up there when i was starting and there weren't quite as many comedians as there might be in london and you know there was another route in my life i reckon where i could have ended up going into doing you know like Oxbridge review stuff and sketches and things like that. Uh, and I think probably had I gone to a different university or stayed in London, that might have been the route that I'd taken. But I ended up going to Manchester and doing it out there. And I think that made me a very different type of comedian. Um, I'm very grateful for it because I think that's why I'm able to go and do, you know, tours and go around the whole country and, and play to not just, you know, posh students. <laughs> I know you said um, you got into comedy. Well, comedy has been a great tool to get the kind of worst part of your personality out so everyone else can recover. Was it your friends or somebody, or was it just a burning desire to get into to comedy? Like, who, who told it's funny you? when you think of it that way, so, yeah. to get all the worst aspects of your, of your personality and flick them on the general public instead of your immediate family and friends. But who's... Who said go and do it? I mean, where where, where did that process come from? Because it's very early on to discover that. Case. Most people, you know, start a career and then go, I think I'm going to go into it. But you're 17 going, I want to do stand-up, com- you know, stand-up comedy. It was Edinburgh Festival. I went up to the Edinburgh Festival, actually, with Freddie. I uh, bet you did. Weekend away with the lads. Really interesting shows, actually. And and, and, and in some of them, people were wearing clothes. Uh I yeah we went up there and I and I, it was my first ever experience of being at the festival and it was amazing um, 
saw Michael McIntyre playing to a room of like 30 people and was, you know, blown away by him. Um, and there were, you know, several other stand up shows that I went to and thought, wow, this is amazing. I'd never seen live comedy before. And then by the next year, I was doing a sketch show up there. Like it was, it was the minute I'd gone up there, I was like, well, this is <clears throat> the world for me. And took a sketch show up there with my friends. It was probably um, not the best piece of uh, comedy that's ever been created. In fact, it got some quite savage reviews. <laughs> what, like but, what? Uh, one star. The only good thing about this um, show is the color scheme of the costumes. That was one. That was one review from Chortle, which was like is like the bible of stand up comedy, and they absolutely savaged it. And then during six months ago, during lockdown, they, because there was no uh, Edinburgh Festival, they reprinted a load of reviews and dredged that one up. I was like, oh, good. I thought that one had been buried, never to be seen again. But they they dug that up and and shared with the world the one star review I got in my first ever live comedy experience. But it was terrible. I did, went on and did like my first ever attempt at stand up comedy, but I'd never even done a gig at that point. I just was like, oh, we'll do a sketch. And then in the middle of 10 minutes, I was just going to do some stand up. So I wrote some stand up comedy, which was basically like my impression of what I thought a stand up comedian should be. And I did some just like woeful jokes. Woeful jokes. There was one about uh, Ameri- like, uh, Ameri- like Americans calling football 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 and soccer soccer like that kind of observation oh, no. like yeah. that, that. i was 17 <laughs> yeah but even 17 year olds know not not to talk no that even much. 17 year olds have got better material than that yeah. 17 year old didn't i mean i didn't realize for how far you were starting back behind the grid because you know at 17 i you know i was funnier than that well i had those glasses on and i took my shirt off to do the routines in so i looked funny <laughs> that's that, that well look i mean i think it's amazing that, that you that you did that you said that you had some moments where you absolutely bombed is there anything that really kind of sticks in your mind or a place that just only holds bad memories for you that you were never quite accepted because some of these working men's clubs can be so particular yeah i mean there's no there's no specific one time ah uh, there was one there was one t- really hard gig i remember where i was comparing for the first time ever i was like yeah great okay i'll compare and the the, the only slight problem with comparing then is i was probably a little too early to start you know comparing a gig because it didn't have enough material but i was like i've got 20 minutes so if i spread it out and i do you know seven minutes at the beginning then a little bit in the middle and then like just a tiny bit at the end then you know, I can just spread that 20 minutes over the course of the evening and I'll be fine. I'll try and do like a little bit of crowd work, but I didn't really do crowd work. I was quite a scripted comedian back then. And so I went and I, and I compared and there was like not many people in the audience. It was a student union in Wigan and it was uh, like a, quite a tough night. Anyway, the, the headline act turned up really late. So it was already really stressful because I was like, oh, I don't think the headline is going to turn up on time. He turned up, took one look at the room. He was like, I want to get paid um, now up front. And the promoter was like, it's a check to follow you. It's not cash on the night. And he went, all right, well, I'm getting in the car and going home unless you give me cash now. And the promoter was like, well, we, I don't have the cash. Obviously, look, there's not a big turnout here, but I will pay you with a check. And he was like, okay, right, I'm off. Got in the car and left. And the promoter was like, um, I think you're just going to have to go on and headline now as well. I was like, man, I've only got, like, I've done all of my jokes. I have no other comedy. Like, I've expended every single minute of it. And also, I'm the compare. The last thing they want is their you know, oh, there's no headline act. I'm just going to do another 20 minutes. Like even if I did have material, it would have been horrific, but I had to then go on and like fill for 20 minutes just doing like more crowd work with no jokes to 20 people because the um, headliner had got in his car and just fucked off because he didn't fancy it because he wasn't getting paid in cash. Like the stress levels, even just Uh. hearing that story are are like, uh, that would be horrific. I'd, I'd, I'd get, I don't have anxiety, but I would get it trying to fill a gap like because I would be quite scripted if I ever did that like I do after dinners and stuff like that and because I got used to the stories I embellish and I do some crowd stuff when when I do it but not not 20 no. minutes of stuff when you run out of ideas no, when you just run out and you're just like completely drawing a blank like you know you get it sometimes and you have to fill and you've just forgotten your everything that you've ever thought of that's funny I wondered about your dad um, when you said I'm going to pursue kind of comedy. I imagine it was a bit like a scene out of that Billy Elliot film where, where Billy mm. Elliot, where he's like, you know, I'm, you're boxing and he's like, I want to dance. And you're like, yeah, yeah. your dad sort of just, did he go into a room and give himself a Chinese burn or were you sent to the tower, to the West Wing? How did it work? No, I mean, to be fair, he was actually kind of, 
Yeah, I think he sort of, he, he probably saw it coming when I started doing, you know, performances at school and, and going and doing sketches at Edinburgh. I, I think he, he felt like it was probably an inevitability. He, he wanted me to go off to art school and get a degree. I don't know why he thought art school would be a good backup for, you know. Seeing you and Freddie's kind of boring. Each other. Work. Yeah, like, oh, you can go into a nice secure industry like painting. I mean... <laughs> It seems slightly illogical, but he, anyway, he insisted that I go and um, do some kind of st more studying and, and I went to art school and then went to Manchester University to do history of art. Again, like a really great profession for <laughs> just finding loads of jobs and um, careers in. Uh, but that's quite funny, actually, is that I when I was doing history of art, I was like, this is like, I'm literally just doing this so that I can be in Manchester. I liked history of art at school or whatever, but I never saw it as having anything to do with what I would end up doing in my career, especially not stand-up comedy. I was like, this is just like completely useless to me. Um, but I'll do it for a couple of years and then I'll go and be a stand-up comedian. And I always felt that that was the case. And then uh, a couple of years ago, there's this lady, Hannah Gadsby, who did this sh show, Nanette, which is it's probably like the highest reviewed stand-up comedy special ever on IMDb. It won like every award going. I think she got like a Grammy for it. And it's incredible. It's like so good. It's one of those shows that you watch it and you're like, I should just quit because I'll never make anything as good as this. And a large part of the show is about history of art and how she studied history of art and then she worked in history of art. She then did a subsequent show that is all about history of art and it, it almost runs like an art history lecture, but it's like a stand-up comedy version of an art history lecture and she brings in lots of paintings and her art history knowledge. You could not have a better and funnier application of art historical knowledge than in these two shows. And I was just like... Yeah, maybe I should have listened a bit more or completed that course. Wasted your time. <laughs> so wasted. Is there any sort of surreal moments where you've you've realised that you kind of made it? I know everyone always wants. Well, when to I got to meet it. James Haskell for the first time, that was <laughs> well, a pinch moment. That, well, I can't imagine that is. That's more of a nightmare for a like comedy hero. That's when they know that they're going on the way down. Is when they get to to meet me. But what what are any oh, sort of moments where you've, you've? I'm a lowly vicar, and to meet the Archbishop of Banbury. When that happened, oh, you make my head. My head couldn't get any bigger. I've got a huge cow head. I'll be scraped. Won't get through the door of the studio by the time I get out. <laughs> Wait, but what? Um, yeah, but like someone like meeting like the Rock, who, by the way, I think him and I would actually be best friends. You know, you you see someone from a distance, you're like, we would merge. Like, wouldn't believe. He doesn't know it yet, but he will do one day. Yeah, I think you might. It would either be that, or you'd come on way too keen and. He would be like, then you need to take this man away from me. And security would swarm. I feel like it would be either lifelong friends, ride or dies instantly, or restraining order. I am a bit well, It would take a lot of his security to take you down, to be fair. But that would you impress go, him. That would impress him, though. Imagine yeah, if you beat him all up, you'd be like, that guy's with me. You're all fired. And then you end up being his past bodyguard. Oh, my God. This is such a good plan. Can we can we make this into some sort of TV series commissioned by yeah. Jack Whitehall? I would love to be The Rock's bodyguard. <laughs> oh, I just want some of his French toast and some of that tequila. Yeah, the tequila is great. But, I mean, apart from putting The Rock aside and James Haskell aside, any moments you've sat down there? Cause, because, as you said, your, 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 your move into comedy has been kind of meteoric. One minute you weren't there, and then a minute you were everywhere. I just remember it, of like going, I, every time I turn on the TV, you're there, you're doing stand-ups, you're getting Netflix. There must have been a moment where you thought, Do you know what, this is going all right for me. Yeah, I think there are definitely moments. You, you never, like, go, oh, well, I've done it, I'm, I'm, I've made it now. Like, there are obviously moments where you you sort of benchmarks and, and, and exciting uh, experiences that you're like, you want to savour them a bit. I think definitely playing Hammersmith Apollo for the first time was, was one of those. And I remember coming off stage and, you know, really taking a moment to enjoy it and appreciate it. And, and it's somewhere that I, you know, right from the get-go when I was first starting out, was like, a, you know, it'd be a dream to play there. And, and then, you know, moving from there to the O2 was again, a, a slightly surreal experience. And one that I definitely, you know, uh, was very proud to have been able to, to do. Um, and then, you know, in terms of like acting, I, I guess like 
walking onto a big movie set for the first time, you know, that that's when you when you get on there, like it is hard not to be a child and <laughs> to be completely in awe of it and uh excited that, you know, you're 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 doing something of that scale and um I actually remember the the, uh, the first time I did like a big film, I didn't really have a particularly big part in it. Um but it was um <laughs> it's not and it's not a particularly good film. But it's Gary Marshall's Mother's Day, which is currently on Netflix, which is, um, you know, it's not one of the great movies of all time, but it was like my first ever film. And it was with like Julia Roberts and Jennifer Aniston and all these people. And so I was, you know, so excited. And Gary Marshall was the director. who's like an absolute legend, a Hollywood, you know, icon really. And, you know, started up Happy Days and directed Pretty Woman and, um, you know, some other like amazing movies and the nicest man you've ever seen, like the nicest man you've ever seen uh, and or met. And he was like really old. And I remember like walking onto the set and like Judy Roberts was there and all these other people. And I remember he like called me over and like sat me down and like literally gave me a little pep talk just to like put me at ease because he tell, could tell that I was like a little bit overawed and a little bit nervous. And then he took out a dollar bill and he signed it and he gave it to me and he said, this is a thing that I do for every single, you know, actor that I've ever done a movie with, I sign a dollar bill when they're having their first close up. And I did it for Julia when she was in Pretty Woman because I directed her for the first time ever and I'm doing it for you now and he signed it and he gave it to me. Um, and then I went and did the scene and like fluffed all of my lines and it was probably pretty terrible. But I remember that like, it really, you know, he he took such an effort to, to make me feel like part of it and to feel like an important part of it. and. He was a really amazing person, uh, and I, you know, I felt very fortunate that he was like the first director that I worked with. Because, uh, you know, I imagine there are lots of people who, you know, step onto the sets for the first time and they're working with like, I don't know, Michael Bay or some like big alpha, uh, like terrifying presence, and it's probably a horrific experience. Or they're like, oh my god, what have I let myself into? But I was lucky that my like first ever, you know role in a Hollywood film is with famously the nicest director that you could possibly work with. Has there been any sort of downfalls about having your sort of parents in, in, in the mix? Um, you know, have they, because they've almost... Only that now that I've unleashed them, I can't put them back in the box. Yes. She's on Instagram, like, voraciously. And, you know, I, she's like a, she's like a Love Islander. But it's not just, like, at least a Love Islander gets a year in the in the sort of limelight, you know, doing the rounds like Hillary Whitehall, she's just she's she's gone now. We've lost her. She'll be doing a boohoo campaign soon because she's sort of like a you know she's a late star. It was you and your dad, late and then she's starter. she's a late starter. But but I, I from a personal point of view, I actually quite enjoy that they've had a second lease of life. Look, because everything that you've done, normally your parents bring you up, you have a thing, you then separate and develop your own life. You sort of did that and then gone, oh, by the way, can I have some of my life and we're going to do a whole nother section of life, which must be quite yeah. exciting for them. Yeah, it is. And I think, um, you know, they enjoy it and they enjoy that they're involved. Uh, we've, <laughs> we've written a book together. Um, Oh, I'm going to show you something in exclusive. This is so funny. I'm very excited to see this. <laughs> When's the book out? What's the book about? The book is um, out in, I think, September, October. And it's all about um, traveling, family holidays. It's a bit of a kind of like a, like a funny travel guide, but with lots of anecdotes from our times spent traveling around the world. Um, I write most of it, but they sort of chip in every now and again. And there is one element, because we're doing it all remotely, obviously, and uh, doing it on a Google Drive, there's a fair amount of like writing it and then reading each other's bits and putting in notes. This is a note I got from my mom the other day. I'd written a joke where I was talking about travel games. And <laughs> I, uh, I was talking about like games you can play in the car uh, or when you're on holiday. And I made a joke about the game Never Have I Ever. And I said, there's nothing worse than playing Never However with your family. One of the kids getting overexcited, trying to cheekily confuse the adults by saying, never have I ever had a 69, only to have the joke seriously backfire when granny takes a swig of her Bloody Mary. This is made even more disturbing when you realise granddad's drink has remained untouched. 
So a silly little joke about 69s. Not a true story, obviously, but just, just a, a little funny joke. My mom in the in, <laughs> next to it has put a note going, sorry, I'm being really dense here, but I don't get this joke. Could you explain? And I'm like, oh, what do I even do? And then it's like, do I reply to that? Do I call her up and explain to her? I can't, I don't know whether she doesn't understand the joke, whether I'm going to have to now explain to my mother what a 69 is. If I delete it, does it make it weirder? It's a funny joke. I want to keep it in the book. I mean, sort of you've built a routine by accident there. Because <laughs> I think you're going to have to, yeah, I think your mum doesn't know what a 69 is. When the comp Well, then I'm going to explain to her what a 69 is. She probably doesn't know what Never How I Ever is, so I'm going to have to explain those two elements. Then she's going to work back from that and ask me why I'm talking about my grandparents and whether this was anything to do with them. I just meant grandparents and gen families in general. I was just using it to, you know, like the Owen Farrell thing earlier, I was just using it to express a point. I didn't mean my specific grandparents. Then we could get into all manner of territory. Oh my god! I mean, have they turned into divas? Have they, have they turned into divas at all with this kind of, this level of this sort of fame and this new adventure, or are they kept their heads up? No, I mean they've you know they're not they're they're, they're definitely not divas, but they definitely enjoy um, it. Or they always claim they don't. They're like, oh, you know, this is you know, we we'd be perfectly happy just you know sitting at home. But I do think they actually kind of enjoy it um, and enjoy. It people coming up to them and asking for selfies and stuff. Because you said your dad um, basically has the shortest work days ever, can only work on a certain period and demands wine wherever he goes, which I thought was quite <laughs> quite amazing. Yeah, he has to he has to um, be, f f like, wrapped by quite early in the afternoon and likes to turn up pretty late, has to have lunch every day at one o'clock. There has to be wine wherever we are. So there's a lot of my mum kind of ferrying around little bottles of Chardonnay in a cooler so that he's kept happy. But it's great for me because I get to work 80-year-old man hours, which are the best hours. It's a nightmare when you then have to start filming with people your own age. Like when I was doing that League of Their Own thing, I forgot you have to get up early and film quite late. Not that they're my own age. I'm considerably younger than both of those gentlemen. Um, but yeah, working with Michael Whitehall definitely does have his advantages. He oh, also has his advantages, but I was going to ask you, what, what are there any sort of horror stories that you can tell us as to working? You told one on uh, my podcast I do with my wife, was couples quarantine about having to hold your dad's hand while he shat himself, which was, I think, but probably. There's, yeah, there's a story actually in our in in, the, in this book about um, uh, when we were in Cambodia. It was quite a funny incident where he'd been on a long haul flight for the first time ever and got a lot of back pain. And uh, one of the crew suggested that he get a massage, um, but then decided that he'd warn my father that getting massages in that part of the world could come with um, certain uh, additional services that he might not require, uh, which obviously put, you know, the fear of God into my father. So he organized this massage and it said that he would only do it if I sat in on it. And I was like, what do you mean sat in on it? I was like, I want you there to observe it in case she tries any, you know, funny buggers with me. I was like, I, I assure you she won't. And, you know, you can just say if that, if anything did, you know, develop that you didn't want those services. I did not need to be there to make sure, like, I'm, you know, a prison guard, a, 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 like a, a visit. He was like, no, I'm not doing it unless you're in the room. So I had to sit in the room and watch my dad get massaged to make sure that the lady didn't try and give him a happy ending. <laughs> it was so weird. And he was sort of moaning and grunting and groaning and, and she was really going at it as well. And I had to sit there in the corner just watching to make sure I could see her hands at all times. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i sort of, I really like your dad. I was sort of a bit disappointed that he, you know, I mean, that, why would you ever complain? I don't know what the downside of that is. Like, oh, someone might accidentally give you a happy ending massage. Oh, no, that's awful. I'd absolutely hate that. No, he's a happily married 80 year old man. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, we all are. But if it accidentally happens, just say no. Just well, say absolutely. No. Well, yes, I think. Yes, I well, I agree. Is he I... concerned that he might not be able to control because they're quite professional? No, I'm led to believe. 
No, not not the not the would not be able to control himself. What I mean is that they, from what I led to believe from friends that I, I couldn't possibly comment who they are, they've said that um, you know, obviously they can they do a process to get to the result <laughs> of you then and then offering it. So I just wondered if your dad was concerned that you know things might start up that he might not be able to stop. I think it would be probably quite hard to start. I imagine starting him up would be like <laughs> that's what I mean. starting up an old tractor on a cold winter's day. <laughs> but that's what I thought. The woman should get some sort of a medal. If she can get that out of him, surely yeah, that's I... worth, you know, we've gone off piste here. I got, we've I gone just... off piste severely. Severely. Well, look. Horrific images in my head. Sorry. Well, you know what I mean? You I know. put one in your head last time. So. You did, actually. Um, listen, Jack, thank you so much for, for your time. I don't want to, you know, to keep you uh, too much longer, I just got one more sort of you know, question for you. Do you think, um, you know, with the kind of the, the cancel culture nature that we're into at the moment, that do you do you worry um, about what you're going to do mo moving forward? Or I know your comedy is not overly aggressive in, in in some respects. Do you sort of feel like you have to sense yourself a bit more now? A little bit more. Everything, every word that comes out of my mouth, I'm slightly concerned about, and every gig or podcast, I'll probably end up after this going, oh God, did I say anything that's going to get me in trouble? It's just not worth it. I wish I could be like Ricky Gervais and just be like, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to say whatever I like. And I'm, you know, you can make yourself uncancelable by taking a certain attitude, but I just don't think I have that attitude. And I don't really do that comedy, but it must be quite liberating to be able to just go through life like that. But, um, you know, I definitely uh, try to be a little bit more careful about what I say. I try to have that approach, and Chloe keeps telling me off, saying you just can't, you can't do that. A, you're not. Apparently, comedians out of everybody, you are afforded that luxury, or you were in the past. Uh, and apparently, I obviously clearly don't fall under the remit of a comedian. So I keep saying no. what I, I keep saying what I want, and and what yeah. I think, and everyone keeps saying no. You can't. I keep ending up in the newspaper about it. Yeah, you probably do need a filter. Well, I know this is probably a good idea. Well, I should take advice if you're being considered. But I mean, I, I was channeling my inner Ricky Gervais. But I suppose yeah. he he's sort of an island in himself, isn't he? Really? Yeah. But you, yeah. but you, um, have you got anything left that you want to really do? Sort of no, you know, something that, an itch that you want to scratch that you haven't yet achieved? Because the Netflix specials, congratulations on them, by the way, are unbelievable. Surely that was a a big moment for you and for your for your bank account. Well, I think professional rugby really is the, is the final goal. And now that Eddie Jones's team is in transition, I'm waiting for the day that he says. We're moving on Farrell and forward. Whitehall, get that boot off. Get your goggles on. Here are some, you know, Umbro branded glasses. We'd love you to be our new fly half. I've never heard well, it pronounced Umbro. Off, I would want to be on the wing. I've never heard it pronounced Umbro. I quite like that. Uh, what is it? Umbro. Umbro, yeah. But Umbro, just... Umbro's middle class. Umbro. Maybe maybe Umbro should, maybe they should relaunch the middle class. Umbro. What well, made you possible? Where, so where, when's your book out? Where people, where can people find it? They can pre-order it now, I believe, on, I guess, Amazon. And probably WH Smiths and Waterstones, I would have thought. Yeah, all maybe. of them. Amazon, Waterstones, WH Smiths, Otakas. Do they still exist? Otakas? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I just, <laughs> I just wrote my book with a bookshop that's gone into administration. But you've, you've named everyone else. I have it now. Otakers. Why would Otakers? It might, it might exist. I don't know. Spit niche. Again, we're going off piece. We've gone so far off piece. We're, in the, we're on the side of a mountain. HMV? Yeah. Woolworth? Woolworth. You can get it in any of those spaces. Perfect. Um, they've got a couple of copies. You've obviously had a, a Netflix, a few Netflix specials out. Uh, what, what's the name of it? The, the last one that people can find or ones that you really recommend? <laughs> Otakers. <laughs> It's dead, isn't it? Otakers, Otakers is gone. Otakers. <laughs> I went a long time ago. How long it's been since I bought a book? Otakers went defunct in 2006. And I still thought Otakers was a book. My publisher is going to be so upset with me. My first promotional commitment of the book tour, and I've told people to go and buy my book from a shop that closed in 2006. Well, I assume on your social media profile, you've got a, you've got a lit links. Is it just at Jack Whitehall, Instagram, Twitter? Yeah, at Jack Whitehall, Instagram, Twitter. Mate, you're a, you're a hero. Good luck with the with the food pop-ups and the burgers and the delivery stuff. Um, you're a hero. I, I know you're going to only go on to keep doing amazing, amazing things. And I've got one thing to ask. I'm going to try and pitch an idea once that you're going to be involved in whether you want to be. Do you think you can make me into a stand-up comedian? Uh, yes. How long have I got? How long do you think you need? 
with you sometime. No. <laughs> I, I think I, yeah, I think I could. All right. Well, we'll see. Right. We'll, we'll test it. Was, we're actually trying to pitch. We we're trying to pitch an idea, and they said it has to be someone that nobody's heard of. And I said nobody's heard of me, but apparently it wouldn't wash. So, um, but me I'm, turning you into a stand-up comedian. Well, no, this is a separate idea. I've just come to listening to through this show because I think you'd be a great mentor. I think it'd be great. Yeah. I'm not sure how my what my my style would be, but just like banter, double barrels, boom, boom, boom. Fine. All right. Well, look, you heard not... it. You heard it here first. If I ever make it, but Jack, you're a top man. Thank you so much for for coming on. Um, and hopefully, I'll catch you. We'll catch you soon. Yeah, this is what a flank of the podcast series two. You can please subscribe. Please share. Uh, you can find it at all your favourite podcast spots. And, and bear in mind, it's also a YouTube show. Jack, I love you. Uh, you, 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 you. You've probably got two other podcasts to record this afternoon, so I'll let you get to them. Thanks, brother. See you, mate. That's podcast. That's what I do. We've got too, too many. <laughs> I, I don't think being a podcast is not even cool anymore because everyone's got a podcast. It's awkward, isn't it? Podcast P. Podcast, podcast <laughs> P. You, you, you probably got a dinner date with Fred, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll catch you later. Some for him. See ya. He's actually sketching me naked tonight. I so. love that. Can I draw you like one of my French ladies? Absolutely not. <laughs> All right. Love you to speak to you, mate. Cheers, brother. See you, mate.